Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later. But Queen Bess a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. And we'll talk more about her later. Number 9, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number 8, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the Pirate Queen of Ireland. Pirate Queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones' locker with a legendary ferocity. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530 around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess and not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused used to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number 7, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was going to bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. 
Then she said whole village is on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, Queen Isabella the first. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella the first. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegun of Soissons. Okay, maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fridigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number three, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Technically not a queen. I get it. But she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number two, Catherine de Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father, Henry VIII, ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having de legitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. 
At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention, much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift, gift, but if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay? It's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't want to waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love, maybe a bit too much, hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work, even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around, but a thousand-pound royal coffin? They have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you, I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. 
Queen Nzinga, from what is now modern day Angola, was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death, every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number 5. Diamond Scandals Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the Queen, supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the Queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this 12 million dollar necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the Queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake, which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number 4, Test Drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack, and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again, well after the Empress was with him, and that made things a little complicated, but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number 3. Change Religion Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti aka Lady of Grace aka the Lost Queen of Egypt was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Now alongside her new young husband she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power, we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt's religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Atan. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Atan was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle, and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her, and she wanted to find an escape, and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Marie apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, 
It still didn't help her bond with the real common people, and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally, coming in at a number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII, ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother, and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous and honestly, I'm the youngest in my family, I kinda get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis, reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria, during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen, because there was a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack, and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag, your order has arrived. Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon, she has an inner Piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass, they watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too, apparently it's a blast. Check it out if you have the chance. We love that. Keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster, end quote. Like damn, tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it, you're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight, dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now, it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it, but to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life. That's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, 
You're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you? Having a bath on Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. At number seven, mother knows best. I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up six feet under, that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most. And so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number six, we are family. The last queen of Madagascar. Queen Rana Valona was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. That king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Lova the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's... Horrible. Ranalova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also not one buffalo was hunted, nor seen. Great plan. At number five, Queen Batman. Batman. He is justice. We know this. Well, long before Batman, there was a queen who sought vengeance and she did it in the most brutal way. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed because her son was just too young to rule yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she had to do the most that she could with her power while it still lasted, and so she used her powers as monarch to seek justice for her husband's death. She was able to get her husband's killers captured and killed using scolding water, but she soon developed a thirst for suffering apparently and she just kept on going after people. She would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. So if you ever breathe in the general vicinity of the guy who offed her hubby, you could kiss your life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that her killers were from, she devised a plan to bury their tribe's leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that she definitely was not okay. Number four, no crust. This next one, honestly, I stand by. I see no wrong here. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day, she's been known for a few funny, quirky queen things. Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who breaks in new shoes for the queen. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always does that little foot rub. If only I were a queen, damn it. But we're talking about unusual things here. And one of the weirdest things I've ever heard is that the queen has refused crust on her sandwiches. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It's not recent at all. You might be thinking, oh, maybe she's old. She can't chew her jawbones. Nope way back. This goes way back for no reason. Right around the time of Queen Victoria and her husband Albert. They viewed anything square shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I've never thought about death while eating grilled cheese, but now I definitely will. Thank you. This must be a pretty scary job, cutting the crust off the queen's bread. My hands would be shaking the entire time. Also, diagonal or down the middle? Let us know. There's only one right answer. 
At number three, Evil Empress. This next Empress is pretty similar to Olga of Kiev, whom I talked about earlier. Empress Wu Zetan also had a thirst for blood and suffering, but not towards people who have necessarily wronged her. You see, when she came into power, she was determined to keep that power by any means necessary. So she had all of her rivals killed. So anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The Empress ordered the execution of the previous Empress, as well as members of her own family, including her own newborn daughter. She didn't want to risk anyone taking away her power, including her own offspring apparently. She didn't hold back on the methods of eliminating her rivals either. Yeah sure, she could have just done a one two stabby stabby and called it a day, but that's no fun. Instead, she had people poisoned, strangled, mutilated, or even burned or boiled alive. Good soup. Eventually, she retired from her part time job of sending people back to their maker and started spending more time with her lovers and getting addicted to aphrodisiacs. People weren't quick to forget about all that bloodshed though, and so to get back at her, they had all of her lovers killed and the Empress was exiled. She got a little too greedy and Karma came back with a vengeance. Number two, Ice Palace. If you're a fan of the film Frozen, this next one is gonna get you jazzed right up. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. Okay, so in celebration over their victory with the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house, this massive ice palace. Best place to cool down if you ask me, I'll leave. This ice palace was pretty impressive. If I was there, I would 100% lick the walls. Obviously, someone definitely did, you know that for a fact. 20 meters by 50 meters, and even more impressive, there were ice trees and ice birds sculpted inside. How magical is that? Anna arranged this marriage with a prince and one of her maids. Now, they didn't know each other, they were forced to ride an elephant, and all the guests were dressed up like clowns. Yep, yeah, that's all valid, that's all accurate. You heard me. You may be thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, an ice palace in Russia, was that maybe cold? Yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold. They all got sick, dressed like clowns. I went to an ice hotel in Quebec once. Spoiler alert, it's cold and boring. There, I just saved you $70. You're welcome. And finally, at number one, Gladiator Games and Chill. If you didn't ever have to go to work and you could just lounge around all day, what would you do with your time? Really, anything could be possible. You could be like the Bruno Mars lazy song. Well, there's one empress from back in ancient Rome who occupied her time with the company of others. Apparently, Empress Valeria Messalina was famous for her exploits. Since she was empress and she had all this time and money and no one to tell her no, she took full advantage of that and bought a house, turned it into a brothel, and made that her side hustle. A lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Though she had a collection of women who worked there, she also was known to invite upper class ladies to participate in the nightly escapades as well. And don't think that Valeria did jump in as well. She was considered to be quite something in the sack. In the wise words of Ludacris and Little John, she was a lady in the streets but a freak in the bed. <laughs> the Empress was known to be such a hardcore participant that she would win games where they would compete to sleep with the most men in one night. One time she won the round after being with 25 men one night. She did the absolute most, but at least she was having fun. At number 10, blinded by ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard 
me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So, surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is, until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now, to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel, this corset poke off. But a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks, that should be a musical, not Frozen. Get out of here. I never ate no side bays. A bad relationship can really mess you up. Anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that. Not as many people carry that pain with them as much as Catherine de' Medici did back in the day. Hurt didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken. She basically turned into the type of person that was like, if I'm not happy, no one else is gonna be happy either. Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry, and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time, and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband though, Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven. Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider-Man guy, that's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26, so so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standard, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just you know marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her way. I hope she slept well that night because she did 
the most. Number five, Rebel Princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The Queen's younger sister was known as the Rebel Princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chilonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chalones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Archytatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the T on that? Chilonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you, or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and 
Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just a casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on. Also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. Number 10. Girl Troubles Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg was a kind and loving mother, so long as you were a boy. Unfortunately for the royal mom, she had a great difficulty giving birth to a male heir. So when her daughter Christina was born, Maria proclaimed that she was given a dark and ugly daughter with black eyes. Eleonora often called her a monster. Oh yeah, and she did try to kill her on several occasions. Nothing says mental stability like blaming your daughter for being a daughter. And not more like a son, because the male dominated patriarchy that is royal society has no effect on this, right? Number 9. Eyes on Irene Irene was born into nobility and worked her way up the royal hierarchy. So why is Irene on this list? That's because she's probably the worst mother ever. When her son Constantine grew into adulthood, he made efforts to sideline his mother and challenge her position as a ruler. Irene, feeling some angry mom energy, retaliated in probably the worst way. In 797, Irene organized the capture of her son, and when he tried to escape, ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Constantine would later die of his injuries. Listen, I've had my fair share of minutes clocked out in the timeout corner. You can ask any one of my teachers, they'll tell you. And maybe even a few times today I should be put in the timeout corner too. But holy shit, mom, eye gouging? And that, I ain't that bad. Sheesh. Number 8. No cake for you. Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France, and for good reason. To make a long story short, she was part of the upper class nobility who benefited from the poor and overworked. When in a time of economic ruin, she still found a way to live a life of excess, while literally everyone else suffered. Spending all of France's money on completely ridiculous items, even by Lady Gaga standards, she jokingly became known as Madame Deficit. Eventually, she would be executed in the revolution. The expression, let them eat cake, was most likely not said by her or by anyone. But regardless if it was, it's a statement to show the complete disconnect and ignorance the nobility had when understanding just how bad things were for the working class. They most likely didn't care either. People were starving and putting heads on pikes. Do you really think they had time for cake, your highness? Oh, to be as beautiful and ignorant as an 18th century queen. Number seven. Lovers touch. Some couples flourish, others fizzle out. Some keep their privacy and others like to make out in the hallways, right in front of everyone. Yeah, you know the ones. It's always by a classroom you have to walk by, or it's by your locker. Joanna of Castile leans more towards awkward locker makeouts. It's speculated that she may have had some form of mental illness. After her mother fell ill, she was reported not to be eating or sleeping, which doesn't sound that bad actually. She was also a very envious person who oftentimes expressed her distaste for her husband's mistresses, reportedly attacking one on occasion, which again, doesn't sound that bad. And when her husband died of illness, she kept very close to the man's body and traveled over 600 kilometers with it, where he was to be buried, where she would often open the casket and embrace the cadaver and kiss him. Oh, okay, that's where the unholiness is, gotcha. I know medical knowledge wasn't great, but if your husband died of an illness, you couldn't seriously think that kissing him was a good idea. This is like the third royal I've come across that has a fixation on corpses. Sometimes you just gotta let the dead be dead, man. Number six, who are you gonna call? Queen Maria I of Portugal might have actually been insane. And no, not like, come on down to my local car dealership, these prices are insane. More like the Joker on a magic white powder that shan't be named just in case. I don't want to make you too big angry. She was known for ranting and raving, screaming that she had been damned. Perhaps it was phantoms of the night demonizing the poor soul. In attempts to cure her madness, such advanced scientific treatments like bloodletting and enemas were tried in order to cure her. The enema kind of makes sense. Maybe she's a little blocked up. It happens. I don't know. There were other attempts to cure her of her madness, but nothing seemed to work. While her first years in power were good, no one was ready for what they got afterwards. Hi, yes, uh, I'm calling from the royal court. We think the queen needs an exorcism. Mm hmm. Yeah, we tried that. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, we tried that too. 
Yes, and we did try the uh, tried and true method of Enema, yes. How soon can you get here? Oh, okay, perfect. Yep. Yeah. Yes, I am available between the hours of 8 to 5. Mm hmm. Number 5. A2 Brute. Agrippina of Rome was like many mothers, in the sense that she would do anything for her kids. I'm sure every mom at home watching would scheme and slaughter their way through Roman nobility in order for her son to become emperor, right? I mean, come on, it's for the family after all. She only did it a few times, and sees the wealth of nobles which further solidified her powerful position. And her son, her beautiful baby boy Nero. How did the young lad return the favor of all this bloodthirst and treachery? Like mother, like son. Chose to fatally remove her of her power. What a nice family story right there. My mom usually just makes turkey with the stuffing, but maybe I can ask for the Roman throne this Christmas. Mom! Number 4. Revenge Boudicca was the wife of a man who had spent his time serving the Roman Empire. So when a deal was altered Darth Vader style by the Romans over what would happen to her husband's kingdom, she was pissed. Karen pissed. To be fair, she did have a point. They did unsavory and unholy things to her and her daughters. Plus, the Romans totally lied about not annexing their kingdom. Ok, so now it was time for some revenge. She gathered all the people she could and went on the attack. The Romans surprisingly did not fare that well. Boudicca was having such good luck she decided to burn London down. Of course, no civilians were harmed in the process. <laughs> I'm just kidding, a lot of people probably didn't do too well as humans can't live in fire. Sure, she was owed some revenge, but burning down a whole city? That's a lot. The Romans did eventually catch up, and she was forced to drink poison in order to avoid capture. She is remembered as somewhat of a hero to some. Number 3. Girl Power Tamar of Georgia was a woman who didn't take kindly to men questioning the rule of a woman. As you would wind up dead. She is, no she is noted for having a hand in the golden age of Georgia. Funny enough, she was made a saint even though she vanquished all the orthodox clergymen at the time, for also questioning her rule. Her husband aided in conquering more land, but when he couldn't keep it in his pants, she banished him and remarried. You go girl, you commit acts of unholiness and stand up for yourself. Number 2. Serial Killer Daria Saltkova was not necessarily a queen, but she was Russian nobility. She had strong connections with the royal court and other Russian nobility. She was also very unholy. Now, Maybe you can blame it on her being widowed. Maybe she's just crazy. But her actions were sadistic. She's noted for having severely tormented her serfs and would straight up just kill them, with numbers reaching at least 138. At first, complaints about family members disappearing after working for her royal nightmare were ignored. She was just too powerful and connected. Eventually, a petition was put together and shown to Catherine the Great, where it was decided Daria would be tried publicly. She spent one hour in a public space in Moscow where people scorned her for her crimes. She was then sentenced to prison where the rest of her days were spent. She is also at times compared to Elizabeth Bathory, who committed similar non nightmare inducing crimes. Just kidding, they were an absolute nightmare. Number 1. Her Royalness Queen Elizabeth II Queen Elizabeth II may be the modern Queen of England, but that does not make her free of controversy and unholiness. If you are to believe in conspiracy theories, then perhaps old Blighty had a hand in a few things that to a normal person would be considered immoral. The death of Princess Diana immediately comes to mind, as there is some evidence to suggest the family is behind it, and her being the queen and all, it's easy to make the connection. But perhaps the most unholy crime ever committed, apparently the queen likes her sandwiches with the crust cut off. Imagine all the extra time needed to trim the crust off every sandwich. I want to talk to HR just thinking about all the extra work. But maybe you can cut the crust off of mine? Um, don't tell anyone though. Ok, thanks. Number 10. Marie Antoinette Madame Deficit The last queen of France and maybe the last time royals got away with well, being royals. Her whole existence was opulence, which is really just salt in the wound when most of your citizens probably can't even afford a portion of salt because they're broke or because there's food shortages. Wasn't a good time. But if you looked into the royal palace, you can bet she's got a pantry full of bread and a bowl of fruit just ready for the pickings. She even had the nerve to purchase a necklace that if through today's inflation would be worth 12 million dollars US. Ooh, that's a lot of money I wish I had. People were starving, and honestly, if people don't have anything, including food, ooh, it's not gonna be a good time. Imagine a whole country acting up because they haven't had their Snickers yet. Well, that ended up sparking a revolution. Very confusing. And in all that confusion, both the king and queen lost their heads. Wasn't good. Number 9. Queen Victoria. Oh, blighty. 
Man, it must be nice to have a whole era in history named after you. Maybe I'll get one one day. The cheddar time. I don't know. She's, I don't know. Big Ched? We'll see what happens. Queen Victoria had some strange quirks about her. One that I can almost get behind, but not quite, is her niche for eating fast. Maybe too fast. I'm a guy who likes to make things simple, easy meals. The faster I can slip into a couch with an ice cold beer and a movie, I'm a happy guy. And or enjoy said food with the movie. Queen Victoria liked her meals to last no longer than 30 minutes. That means while you're on the appetizer, she's on the main course. And while you're on the main course, she's ordering coffee. Look, I respect the hustle. I get that. But maybe this is too much. That being said, are you going to be the one who brings it up to her royal majesty? Listen, if you want to see tomorrow's five minute brunch, you better keep it to yourself. Number eight, Cleopatra. Don't we all miss Elizabeth Taylor? I know I do. Sometimes, I wish I was her. She's just beautiful. Can you blame me? I honestly wish I was the real Cleopatra too though. All that power and to not have one, but two Romans wrapped around her finger. Ooh, she was the last pharaoh of Egypt, but maybe had the most drama. Sure, Elizabeth Taylor was the most beautiful and chic woman in all of Hollywood, and she may or may not have had a few men wrapped around her finger too, but she never had to deal with the world's largest empire and her own throne all whilst managing to stay the most beautiful and chic. I can barely manage to toast toast in the morning. Never mind all those affairs and, um, well, the marriage affairs too. There's a lot, of, a lot of affairs happening. Number seven, Queen Isabella of Spain. Queen Isabella is known for a few things. A lot of stuff YouTube probably doesn't want me to talk about. Insert religious persecution here. However, I think she should be remembered for something else, something rather strange. When I was a kid, I would run around outside for hours, oftentimes ending up in the mud. My mother would always say, it's time to hose you down, son. And she wasn't wrong, because I, I probably needed a good hose down. Now, regardless of how much dirt was behind my ears, I didn't want to wash. It was this big stupid kid, can you blame me? I was proud of the scruff, but that's because I was going to have another wash most likely within the next 12 hours. I always got hosed down at some point. Queen Isabella, however, boasted to others that she only bathed twice in her life. Sweet Lord, Mary Mother of God woman, that is not something to boast about. Due to some water access issues, the Catholic Church was like, ah, baths? Who needs them? You know what? Baths are sinful anyway. Being so close to God, so she doesn't bathe. Cleanliness is next to godliness, except in that time period where not bathing means you're actually closer to the big JC upstairs, so that's how it goes. Number six, Queen Elizabeth II. No crusts. Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch. God bless the queen, and God save the queen. Shout out to the UK, Chetty loves you, how you doing? Come, come and see me sometime, I love you guys. Now sure, she's not the most awful spoiled queen in history, but she is a queen, and that does mean she can have things her way. Like for example, all of her sandwiches have to have the crusts cut off. Yes, just like children. Yes, just the way I like them too. No, I'm not a big baby. I'm a big strong man who totally doesn't rely on the women in his life. Pfft, no, what are you, what are you saying? Dude, stop. Mom, I love you. Anyway. Well, yes, it's true, the queen's sandwiches have to have her crust cut off. Is it the worst thing ever? No, I don't think so, but what if her sandwich showed up with crust? We don't really burn people at the stake anymore, so what would she do? Would she fire them, I guess? It's kind of a little thing to get fired over. I don't know, anyway. Speaking of getting fired. <laughs> Number five, Empress Irene. Mother dearest, most people have fond memories of their mothers. Maybe you should call her, I'm just saying. Mother's Day happened, you should call her. Empress Irene was a woman who wanted power. Honestly, who doesn't? We've all got a little bit of Sith in us, yes. Her son, who had naturally inherited some of her power, was growing stronger by the day. Now, maybe it was ego, maybe it was envy, maybe her son just took down her live, laugh, love signs. I'm not sure. But Irene was not having any of it. So when her son least expected it, she had two guards apprehend him and had his eyes gouged out. Now, being that this was before 2022, this was a critical medical injury. And after nine days of grueling pain, and when I'm sure it was a lot of blind confusion, the injury proved to be fatal. So what's the lesson here? 
Uh, blood is not as thick as water. Ah, I don't really know. It's just messed up. Number four, Queen of Castile. Life can be tough sometimes, especially when we lose the ones we love the most. Everybody deals with things differently. The Queen of Castile is a person who deals with that, well, very differently. People passing on was no rare occurrence back in those days. There's a thousand reasons on how you could wind up six feet under. When the Queen of Castile's husband passed away from the disease of the month, she was devastated. Rightfully so. That's rough. However, that being said, sometimes you gotta take that with a little grace. For days, she would not leave her husband's side, even after he was a cold cadaver. Later on, that corpse would travel with her, apparently even stopping a carriage once to get out and kiss his feet. It's weekend at Bernie's, except a lot sadder and gross, and uh, not a charming 80s movie. Oof. Number three, Carlotta of Mexico. This is a new one for me, but an interesting story nonetheless. Basically, France wanted a piece of Mexico, and I mean, come on, who doesn't? It's gorgeous. Carlotta was a Belgian princess who kind of just married into the royal family and got plopped down in some chaos in Mexico. There was a war, enough political strife, to make anyone involved in the Watergate scandal start to look for documents. It was messy, it wasn't a good time. It got so bad that she had to go back to Europe and basically made the call that all university students have to make after fraud. Week. Hey mom, uh, dad, uh, listen, um, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Uh, do you think maybe um, you could send me some money? Yeah, I, I need some help. Except her phone call wasn't like that. Her phone call was more like, hey, European nobility, uh, can you come please save my husband because he's about to get de-lifed and like stabilize the country? Thanks, spoiled princess calling, hi. It didn't work out in the end. He got de-lifed, she went back home and uh, well, she went a little crazy. Number two, Elizabeth Bathory. Serial D-lifers, your queen has arrived. I think this one is one of the more interesting cases in history. Usually when you think of a creepy D-lifer that lurk in the night, you think of Gacy, Dahmer, you know, guys like that. It's not very often that it's a woman and or someone from before the 19th or 20th century. That's just how it goes. I'd also argue perishing and manual D-lifing was a part of life back in medieval times, so kind of hard to quantify what is and isn't a serial D-lifer or life taker. However, I think she counts. The body count is estimated to be somewhere in the hundreds, and a most peculiar rumor is that she bathed in the blood of her victims. Ooh, that's gross. Bathing in water, that checks out. Bathing in mud, you go to a spa, that checks out too. Bathing in beer, sticky and strange, but check, I've done it. Uh-huh, one time I did that. Bathing in blood, mm, that's a no cow zone for me, chief. While the bathing in blood thing might be false, the evidence of her crimes uh, were not. Imagine being so spoiled you can hide bodies. Mm. Number one, Queen Mary. Henry VIII was a big bad dude who wanted it his way. He wasn't the Burger King, although by looking at him you could tell he was uh, packing a few of those bad boys away too. No, he was the King of England and he had many wives and was spoiled himself. So, do you think his children grew up humble and wise? Nay, kind sir and madam. Queen Mary took the throne a few years later and wasn't happy with the Protestants. Ugh, too many, she said to herself. Well, if you've heard us talk about her before, she'll probably come up again time and time again because, well, she cooked those people on a wooden stake. Over her reign, countless people felt the fires of her wrath, hence the name Bloody Mary.